Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, so sorry that uh, Chuck Lynn is supposed to join us, but may, hopefully he'll join us. Uh, he's having trouble getting into the uh, webinar. But uh, so hope you had a chance to watch the film, a great film. Uh, and we are so lucky to have uh, Sarah Teal, the filmmaker. I'll introduce her. Uh, one of the two film actors, and uh, John Moreno, the activist lawyer in the film. And uh, uh, please, uh, as you have questions, put them into the chat, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can there. Um, so, uh, and if you didn't get a chance to, if you just uh, registered uh, recently and didn't get a chance to watch the film or finish, uh, you still can watch it for another uh, 24 hours there. So, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, use, you should, when you registered, you should have gotten the link and password with that. Um, and also, if you didn't get a chance to uh, donate, I know we also had a problem with our, our, our link on the website. Um, uh, in the uh, chat there, uh, there is a, there'll be a link there that, uh, where you can donate. And um, I will, uh, put it into the chat there so you can uh, use that uh, if you're able to. Uh, there's a link there. You can click on that, and I hope that, that should work. Uh, and um, so we're asking for you to donate what you can, but obviously we're not, uh, we're not uh, forcing you to. If, if you're not able to, it's fine. It just allows us to continue this empowering film series. So. Uh, all right, so let me introduce uh, Sarah Teal. She's the producer director of Kill Chain, The Cyber War in America's Elections. It's an Emmy nominated uh, uh, for Outstanding Investigative Documentary from 2021. Uh, I won't list all of her accomplishments because they're quite long, but I'll list a few. She's a producer director on the HBO series, The Weight of the Nation. It was nominated for a primetime Emmy. Uh, other HBO films she has produced and directed include Dealing Dogs and Hacking Democracy, both earned Emmy nominations for Outstanding Investigative Documentary, Death on a Factory, Factory Farm, and Huma Abu Jamal, A Case for Reasonable Doubt, uh, which is also a, a, a nominee for an award. And she, of course, has uh, produced and directed uh, documentaries for the BBC, Arts and Entertainment and Discovery, and the uh, one of the filmmakers with uh, Sarah Jackson for Patrimonio, which is uh, our film. And it premiered at the Berlin International Film Festival. We're delighted to have uh, John Moreno. Uh, he's a lawyer in La Paz, Baja, California, Sur, uh, Mexico, in the municipality of Todos Santos. And he's joining us from Todos Santos. Uh, he provided the legal assistance and guidance to the people of Todos Santos in the film, trying to prevent the uh, American mega hotel complex development and to preserve their ecosystem and way of life. And we'll hear a little bit at the end that John is, is fighting another development in the sand dunes uh, nearby. Uh, uh, one of the sponsors of, uh, we are co-sponsoring this series with Simply Living. Simply Living is a community organization that celebrates and connects people to learning opportunities that promotes community sustainability, environmental awareness, and our local economy through educational outreach and partnerships. And I'm Bill Lyons with the Ohio Community Rights Network. And our mission is to establish a network of just communities working to advance, secure, protect the inalienable rights of Ohioans to democratic local self-governance, uh, to sustainable food, energy, economic systems, and the rights of nature to exist and flourish throughout Ohio. So with that, uh, I'd like to start with John. Uh, can we start with, give us a description of Toto Santos? Uh, and uh, also, were you born there? And just tell us about the town. And so that viewers have, a, have an idea, maybe more than what's in the film. Okay, um, good day, everyone. Um, I am originally from La Paz. La Paz is our state capital. It's on the uh, Gulf of California side. Todos Santos is a small oasis community that's in smack dab in the middle of the desert. 
and we're between the Sierra de la Laguna uh, Cordillera system to our east and to the west we have the Pacific. We are a small town. Um, there's maybe five, six paved roads and we're stuck between Cabo San Lucas and La Paz. Each one are roughly about uh, an hour away north, north and south of us. And um, we've got about a permanent community of about 8,000 uh, residents, but depending on the time of the year and the season, we've got a floating population that takes us up close to around 15,000 between expats, South Americans, Canadians, local native Mexicans and mainland Mexicans. So we are a very diverse group and we've got a wonderful marine uh, Pacific climate that is actually very unique. We've got some cold currents right now, but we are also right smack dab on the Tropic of Cancer and uh, we're a very beautiful little community. Yes. Guys come and visit us. Yes, I, I, I'd love to. And I have a friend who's also recently moved there. So that's how I even heard about the film. So I'm delighted for that. Uh, Sarah first and John, uh, can you tell uh, our viewers here how you first heard about this proposed mega uh, development, the American mega development? And um, yeah, how you and then how you got involved? Yeah, Sarah. Um, well, my, my husband bought um, a big old former sugar hacienda in, in Todos Santos in 1983. So he's been there for a while when there were no paved roads going, and that's certainly no main roads going into town at all. Um, so he's been there for a while, and he had gone down to the fisherman's beach. Um, there's only one beach where the fishermen are able to fish from. They go in and out on their boats up onto the sand dunes, and it's so rough because it's the Pacific all along the coastline, there's just one spot. So he had gone down there and suddenly there was this massive retainer wall that had gone up mm. for this new hotel. And he was horrified, came back and we were told that, oh, the fishermen know about this and they're fine. And, you know. So Lisa, my friend, she and I have both filmmakers for HBO. Um, we decided to pick up Lisa's camera and go down there and ask the fishermen what they think. And of course, they were not at all happy. <laughs> uh, and, and that started and, and they were such wonderful characters and so forceful that we just kept filming. And we thought what we were going to do was make these little teeny films and put them up onto a Facebook page. We created a thing called Truth Santos. We started posting these little things and, um, and then slowly but surely, <laughs> just kept going and then John became involved and we it, it took three years but um, we just kept going and the little bit of filming and kept growing and Lisa moved to Todos Santos um, full time so we were able to just be there for every minute of mm. what unfolded. And John how did you first uh, encounter it? So uh, I, I knew about the development since 2013. I started seeing signs of people trying to do reconnaissance missions and trying to reach out to key people in the community. And just given my profession and um, just because I know everybody here and um, I also monitor the uh, Secretary of Natural Resources and Environment, their website, because they publish periodically all of the impact statements that are submitted for their consideration. So it was a combination of these factors. So we found out about it early on. And in fact, early on, my involvement was basically zero. And I wasn't in agreement with the development, but because they were doing such a good job of trying to convince people and of painting such a beautiful picture that initially I think they had some sympathy and some uh, embrace from certain parts of the community. Uh, that originally I sought out some of the fishermen to see what their position, what their opinion was. And initially they said, oh no, no, we, they've, they've spoken to us. They've given us all kinds of assurances. They've given us all kinds of guarantees. Uh, they want. They say they want to partner with us. And it didn't really span out that way. 
And as things became evident and as actions ceased to match the words, then people's concerns started growing. And that's when they actually asked for my involvement directly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that's really key because um, being an advocate, it's, I, I feel very passionately about many of these subjects, especially uh, earth conservation and protection. Um, however, I do require someone to ask for my involvement. It's not something that I can just go snooping around and diving into anything that, that just because I don't agree with it or mm -hmm. I feel there are certain concerns about it. So when they asked me to get involved, I did. And that was when they really started feeling the effects of the development out in the field. Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting you talk about how they tried to convince the people uh, that they were trying to take uh, their thoughts into consideration. And in the film, obviously, you mentioned the classic greenwashing that they describe sustainability, gardens, yoga, biking, holistic, locally sourced, harmonious living, a thousand acres of wellness, et cetera. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we hear it all the time, right? It's so good. It all the time. And, and that was the first sales pitch meeting we went to in New York. Mm -hmm. And Lisa and I, so Gordon signed up as though he was an interested party to buy one of the, the homes and he signed up. And so Lisa and I just went and, and actually we checked in with a, a lawyer at HBO. Hey, can we go and just sort of film in this space? And he looked up where they were meeting and it happened to be a public space. Hmm. So he was like, go ahead. So yeah. we went and um, Lisa said, oh, you know, my mom wants to buy a place, but she couldn't come. So do you mind if I film a little and send it to my mom? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> And it, but it was so distressing because mm. I could hear what Chip Connolly was spinning and he's a really good spinner. And he started in San Francisco and he's still in Pescadero, the next town to Todos Santos. And he spins these stories. And I knew that they had no relation to what was going on in the ground. Yeah. And I had to leave at one point, I was so angry. But Lisa mm -hmm. just kept filming, which was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, I'd like, like you to mention, and, and also, Sarah, you could add to it if you wish. Uh, talk about the, you know, we, that greenwashing, but the real harms that this that would have happened and some that did happen because of some of the activity uh, that they did uh, and, and the harms that would have happened if this project had been um, completed. Well, the thing is, is that uh, Punta Lobos, the, their, their site, they chose one of the most quintessential sites that um, as a community, we really, the life here, um, it plays an integral part. Uh, as Sarah was mentioning, it's one of the only areas where they can uh, use their boats to go fishing. It's, it's quite precarious. It's quite beautiful, actually. But... Um, they really touched on a nerve. And that's, that's, I think, one of the things that Sarah was describing. There's an air of arrogance when groups of foreign people that have no relation to the land, the community, the environment, mm. the ecosystem, which we as a community are a part of and are integrated into and are at a balance with, and they think it's a commodity and they think that it's something to be exploited and they think it's something that they're going to brand. And that's, that's, the, that's where the, um, a lot of the uh, indignation stems from, you know, mm -hmm. because this is where we are living. This is where we bring up our children. This is where we educate. This is where we find our place in this world. And, and we are living lives that are in balance with that. And these mm. people are coming with different objectives, different principles, different ideas. And they come in and they alter this place mm. where, um, you know, young people, when they are um, with their first girlfriends, would go and maybe uh, make out. And or where um, every year they have a pilgrimage for uh, the Virgin because she is their uh, protector and they have a temple 
and they have a, a, a precision and they they uh, a procession, excuse me, and they march with her, and it's a very intimate um, communion that they have. And so the area, they just went in, they raised the vegetation, mm. they leveled the dune, which per their permits and per their impact statement, they were only supposed to make these uh, boardwalks for public use. You know, it was never supposed to house a hotel right there. They alter the federal zone. They, in raising this platform, because they obviously understood that it was prone to floods and to runoff. And when they raised the platform, they diverted it directly to where the fishermen actually use and have their work area. And so it affects them directly and all of these impacts. And it was really interesting because, you know, one of the socially, there were splits between the community and there was a, there began to be a division of who thought that this was a good thing for the community and those who thought that it wasn't such a good thing. So they begin to divide uh, indirectly and then subsequently directly through payments and the enticement of employment and uh, through threats. And so there were environmental impacts there's economic impacts, there's impacts to certain sectors and to certain social groups. And it's very distressing and it's very disrespectful. Mm -hmm, and it, mm -hmm, it, it mm -hmm. creates a, a, it's a violation. You yes. feel violated. Absolutely. That's the proper word. Yeah, so I think that is that, the right word. The other issue is water. Yeah, yes. For, for all of us in I was going to ask about that. all over the world is water. And they were going to build 4,600 homes, two hotels, and a university campus, a Colorado State University campus, which they did build. And they put in water tanks and water things that were way larger than the one for the town. And we, Todos Santos is an oasis. It sits on a on a water thing that's like a like a sponge, it's like and 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 it's limited, mm -hmm. and it can shut off. And over the years, it has shut off. And Dolores mm -hmm. Santos used to be a very prosperous because it was a sugar growing place, but they got too greedy, grew too much sugar, the water shut off, and they all left. Mm -hmm. And so it's and um, as Carino says in the film, he has known personally seven times in his lifetime as a farmer. This is terrible where the water shuts off. So having that come in not only impacts the quality of the water, it could shut a whole lot off. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was really pretty dire and it continues to be pretty dire, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how's the water situation at the moment? The question about that, somebody. It's uh, so the, as, as Sarah was mentioning, our underwater, uh, underground aquifer, the geological structures, it's a closed, it's a closed aquifer, there are no underground rivers, so we depend directly on the rain and the runoff, and a lot of it, unfortunately, when it's really heavy rains, we lose it to the ocean, probably about 85%, um, and so we depend directly, the aquifer depends on that regeneration to uh, replenish and to provide. It, it was really interesting because CSU, they authored, they did a big water study and they initially, they did not make it public because of certain agreements that they had with mm -hmm. the developer where they could mm -hmm. not pr publish or distribute any opinions, materials, or studies that would shed, uh, put them in a negative light. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was very interesting how their own study uh, raised the red flag and sounded the alarm that with developments as this one and with the current rate of growth that we would be in a critical very critical situation within about 10 years mm. and i think that that in that trend is continuing i think that with um regular whatever that amounts to be with regular precipitation and rainfall the aquifer can sustain what we pretty much have. Mm. But if we begin to have a greater population influx and growth where we are up by 25, 
30, 50%, we're going to really start having problems. And even with regular rainfall, we're not going to have enough water to go around. Mm. And then you have the whole thing about desal, and there's there's a lot of debates about all of that. So uh-huh. it's, it still is a difficult situation. Right mm. now, we're stable, but as we continue to grow, we're destabilizing it, uh, destabilizing it more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, a question about uh, has there been any or is it possible to undo some of the things they did to the beach? I know probably they can't put the mangroves back in that they took out, which is a, a huge thing, but uh, and it caused a lot of erosion. But, uh, uh, you know, is there been any anything that they can do or, or have done on the damage that was done with the buildings that are already there? So with with what is there? The, we have to keep in mind that only a small fraction of what they were originally intending on building actually got built and is operating today. And in the speaking from a legal standpoint, there are three different outcomes that could occur. Um, they could be found that they are in no violation whatsoever and that everything is perfectly legitimate and was executed legitimately and therefore we've just been blowing smoke and we should be leaving them alone. Hmm. It could be found that the permits are legitimate, but they went beyond the scope Hmm. of the permits and therefore they just need to remedy certain things to bring them back into the fold and bring them back into compliance. And then the third would be that both the permits and what was executed was unlawful and therefore, all of it should be removed and remedied. This last option is obviously also the most, the less probable. So I believe that uh, uh, variants of those three are going to occur. I believe that parts of their permits are gonna be held unlawful and will be annulled. And other parts of the permit will be upheld and shall remain in force. I think that the government The government at some times, they tend to try to find the easiest way out of a problem, even if it's not the most strictest uh, in the legal sense. So I think what they're gonna do is they're gonna say that the current hotel and what is already there is gonna stay. Mm -hmm. But that everything else, all other terms of the permit, all other parts and aspects of the development will have to be submitted for review and mm. will have to undergo a new permitting process, at which point I believe they will be under heightened scrutiny and a greater burden to prove that they are within the environmental limits. Mm. Yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up about the permitting uh, issue, because that's one of our issues is that these agencies that uh, legalize harms by issuing permits and then they well, of course this group couldn't find they they right they couldn't produce permits that the fishermen were asking for but here like we're used to these agencies issuing permits and then they legalize the the harm that's done there and then people go to their hearings and they speak but nothing changes or whatever and so they can go, take the legal route and sometimes they don't get anywhere because these permits have just uh, run roughshod over the communities and 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 the interest of you know the environment and the people there. I should say though, John, you won your federal case against them, though, right? Yeah, John won his federal case. I know that's what I said. It okay. was was inspiring. That almost made Mexico seem better than what we experience <laughs> here. Actually, the thing is, is that um, I think that part of their strategy is to make um facts on the ground uh, to create a reality that regardless of what the legality is it it comes to a situation where they're too big to fall they're too big to fail at this point it's so it's so much that Mm. to ask them to remove it would be almost uh out of the question even though uh your permits are illegal and therefore uh, a court has declared that what you were allowed to was in fact illegal and therefore what you built is illegitimate. So mm-hmm. what what should happen? And at that point they start, well, we've got millions of dollars invested. Uh, at mm-hmm. this point, it's 
it's in the community's favor to keep us and to integrate us instead of trying to remove it all and remediate. That really won't favor anything. And you bog down into these debates that really don't take you anywhere. And as you say, they end up legitimizing something that from the onset was illegal. Mm. And that doesn't make sense. That's mm. not justice. No. Um, so it's, it's difficult. It's a very difficult thing. And, and they count on these factors mm -hmm. as part of their strategy. So it's very difficult to, um, to counter. Yeah. But well, what John has done has, is over the years has built this case and has not given up. Mm, and I yeah. think whether this is Florida or Ohio or anywhere, you have to, what John does is read the permits really carefully and he finds the things that they have mm. done wrong and he categorizes them and then, and then pushes these cases and mm. doesn't give up. And that's what it takes is, is people mm -hmm. marshalling the, the evidence, putting the stuff together, marshalling groups together to resist this hmm. and and then going at it from a legal point of view and not stopping yeah <laughs> they're counting but, on people stopping yeah i mean uh yeah that's one thing i wanted to ask about that john uh did you get any help in in your legal actions uh in this regard was it just you and from what i understand you did this work pro bono is that correct uh, that's correct absolutely i did not charge a single dollar for any of my advocacy for any of the legal work we did have support for logistics um but that was community based all the way around we had wow. literally people in the community would go to the blockade and take food they would take water they mm. would um I, I know people that would um, babysit so that people could go out there and stay a shift and support mm -hmm. and people would do signs in town and people would do stickers and people were supporting any way they can. We had people doing um, fundraisers, just grassroots, you know, um, getting um, gas to mm -hmm. go to speak at the Congress getting um, a, a school bus so that we could take all the fishermen and their families to the municipal offices so that uh, we had people donate uh, plane tickets so that we could go to Mexico City. So this was a 100% community effort. That's yeah. great. That's which, is great. The, which is the inspiring thing and it is ongoing. And now in a funny way, it's sort of easier to marshal people. Hmm. So because of what's been happening with the development on the dunes, you know, we've created a website that houses all of the documents, the legal, the or the legal, the dune study that we had raised money and paid for. But now we've putting together a WhatsApp group. And mm. so, so people can go out there and um, do actions, you know, yeah. <laughs> turn up. Um, and it's been amazing. I put this WhatsApp group together. Within a day, we had like 52 people signed up. They're, each one of them is coming up with different amazing ideas. There's an artist who's going to be doing more signs. There's a guy who does marketing for really big companies that is creating the, 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 the signs and the, and the messaging. There's, there's everybody has a different role that they are bringing to this table, and it's really inspiring to, to watch. So it, it's, it's about creating websites that ho house all those Facebook pages, but, but what's up? What's up? groups are incredibly powerful mm. and a very easy way to get people um, motivated. And, and when it came to Trey Santos, we had this Truth Santos, we had a Facebook page um, and we would post videos of what's happening and, and people would post photographs if they'd been down there and seen something else. And, and then it, it just sort of snowballed. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a, it's a community, it's a grassroots thing. And, and, and as I said, whether it's Florida, I see someone's from Florida or whether it's Ohio and the new things that are happening around Columbus, it's, mm -hmm. it is possible to marshal this. Yeah. But finding yeah. a lawyer like John is not the easy part. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I wanna get, get to that there, but that question about, uh, okay, the, the um, uh, this corporation, of course, was being supported by the government and all that. Question about can, how do we prevent something like that from happening again? Is it just from the actions that the community has done that media has exposed them? Or are there any other thoughts in that? So in, in this case, um, as Sarah was mentioning, uh, 
social media was a huge, huge factor and was instrumental in being able to counter all of the traditional media outlets that were uh, completely influenced by the government, by the developer. I think it's really important that um, politicians uh, are, there are consequences for these things. One of the original, and I, and I believe that um, Sarah also did some work in some films, um, one of the big subjects or causes that helped galvanize this community sentiment was we were threatened by gold, open pit gold mining here mm. in our town. And the, the just, just about 10 kilometers, uh, eight miles away, and it would have been devastating, um, you know, it, in, in so many aspects, the water, the contamination, the pollution. Here we're in uh, one of the uh, flory, uh, budding duels of tourism, and yet they want to do a, you know, toxic metallic uh, mining extract, and it just isn't compatible. But that movement which was successful as well um, with the community, the state, uh, both the La Paz and Los Cabos rallied and we were able to stop that uh, gold mining um, mm. operation. So that helped galvanize and this project just uh, came to further accentuate the sentiment and people were able to see how coming together we had uh, a strength and that we had uh, a force together. And that helped, once the politicians started seeing that, that we could uh, influence their mm. lives, mm. they started to paying a little bit more attention. But at the same time, we try not to be political because that's not the realm where most of the decisions and the solutions lie. And in mm -hmm. fact, in the politics, it can be, um, it can be an outlet where they can actually sequester the conversation and take it to a different outcome that you don't really want. And that's what was happening here. Mm. All the authorities were trying to say everything was fine. We've looked into all of your complaints and there's nothing there. Everything's good. Everything's beautiful. The developers are wonderful people. You guys should be praising the development. This is in everybody's benefit. And it was not that way at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's key to have the social community component, the unity, to be able to move in social media, to be able to have the legal component, and to be able to kind of, you know, it does get uncomfortable because you do need to be a little bit forceful. They yeah. count on these things, people not wanting to um, get uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and you have to get uncomfortable. Because yeah. if not, it, it's yeah. just, they're just going to bulldoze right over you and they will, um, they'll move right over you. Oh, yeah. Well, the fact that the people have the courage to do the blockade, I mean, that, that takes courage. And they, uh, you know, and that went on, what, a couple of times for quite a while. And uh, even with the police force pushed on them, even though that was illegal, right? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. We, which we were successful in stopping that at that moment. That was key. But it, to, to that point, uh, I want to bring up something that is um, not said enough, but the women. Huh. The women, the wives, the mothers of all of those fishermen were a key component. They were cooking food. They were providing support. They were egging them on. They were telling you, they were the ones that were telling, no, no, you need to stand up. You need to go and fight this fight. And we back you up and we have your corner. And that was a tremendously powerful thing. And it's, um, it's not said enough and it and it's a really important component you know the, the 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 family aspect the community aspect i cannot stress it enough we we're all in that same boat together and we need to move in the same direction as one mm -hmm. yeah um when when uh, i wanted to go back and and see if i missed something but the dirty tactics that were done first of all those these big money corporation interest uh 
Well, they're the lies, right? And the bribes of elected officials, and even what the, that one fisherman co op group, some of the people on their board as well, faulty environmental impact statement. We hear, we see these things too, of course. Uh, we, and not showing up to the meetings that you had uh, illegally, uh, bringing the police for the blockade, filing lawsuits against you that were bogus, uh, forging the, the signatures. And, and then that I don't understand that they, even though the judge said that they were bogus, they still locked you up there. Uh, tell that, and, and is there some, some other tactics and things that they did that I, that I missed? Yeah, threatened John's life. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I want, yeah, tell me about the, the threats there because the courage and the integrity and commitment that uh, that you had there, we're just in awe. And, and I know that, uh, Sarah, I don't know, I know Lisa did, and I don't know if you did too, also uh, experienced some, some threats, but tell us well, about- they, th they threatened my daughter's life, which, you really? know, when they start coming after your Whoa. family, you feel pretty bad, like uh, we should stop doing this. But, but what happened to John, you, John, you explain was way worse. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's, um, yeah, at, at first, you know, uh, the first things they try to entice you and they try to seduce you and they try to buy you. Mm -hmm. And then when they f find out and they see that that's not an option, then they really, you know, they start threatening you. And as Sarah says, it's not just to you, it's to your loved ones. And that's when you're really in a difficult position. It's, you know, it's, it's difficult to explain because, um, I, I was scared to death the whole time. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie and say that. I, that uh, one of the things about patrimonio that people need to understand is, yes, it's a feel-good story because it had a good end. But Mexico is littered with stories like this. This is far from the only story, far from the only episode. And the other stories don't end up like this. The other mm. stories end up with people not getting out of jail or people being dead. And, and or people being disappeared and never to be seen again, and who knows what the hell happened. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I, there was a point where I got tired of being scared. There is a limit, mm. and you have to start your own body, your own mind starts. You're, you're scared day in, day out, and you're living with this fear. You're living with this anxiety. Your body at one point says, I don't want to feel this anymore. And there's only certain things you can do to kind of take your power back. And it might sound like a cliche, but there gets a point where you're like, well, if something is going to happen to me, well, then I'm going to keep on going because that's the only way I, I'm going to do whatever I can to hit them back too. And, um, and it, that was probably very naive. And when originally I thought that it was just so visible and just so obvious and just so egregious, I said, it, it can't be that they're going to take it that far. And when I started seeing that they did start taking it that far, I started getting you know, deathly uh, scared. And for a time, uh, my wife and my kids went up to the States and they ended up coming back and they themselves said, you know, we, we, we can't be running from it. You know, this is our home, this is our livelihoods. We work here, they go to school here. We can't just crawl up into a hole and, and wither away. So we kept on going and the community support Mm -hmm. Also, I can't stress enough, none of these things will be successful if it's just one individual person. Absolutely. It has to be the community. That is the key. Yeah. And seeing that support, it lets you know that you can make it through this. You can. And then you start seeing how the, the threats and whatnot, they're designed to, uh, to induce this fear. And there's a point where you just can't let it happen. And um, yeah. I'm glad it worked out. Um, <laughs> at some points I thought it wasn't going to work out, but it did. And I'm very, uh, I appreciate everyone that, um, that made that happen. So yeah. how did you, yeah, just keep the hope up 95 days locked up. That's wow. That's just, amazing. it was actually a hundred days. Oh, was it? It was a hundred days. I, I kept on pointing that out to Lisa during the, <laughs> it was a hundred days. <laughs> but um, uh, 
Mexico jail is no joke. It is, it is by far the um, worst experience I've ever had in my life. But at the same time, um, there's a part of me that's, that's happy that I went through that. Um, I don't think I would change it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a better person. I think I learned a lot. I, I try to take away things that helped me grow. And incredibly, and I think this is kind of a, a part of jails everywhere and in incarceration, there's a tremendous amount of darkness in those places. But at the same time, there are moments of, of tremendous light and humanities interspersed with all of this negativity and all of the darkness. There are some moments of very, very profound humanity within all of that. And um, so that's the, those are the things that I want to take away and that I keep close to me and not all the other stuff. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Well, you brought it, you know, the community. I want to get it back to that. And that's why our film series is empowering community. And that is so important. And the Ohio Community Rights Network is part of the community rights movement. And, uh, you know, the community should have the right to decide, uh, have some local self-governance and be able to say, how do they want to live and the things that they deem harmful, keep them out there. And too often we know around the world, the big money interest with the collusion of elected officials, just like the story shows, imposes uh, secretly decided harmful or unwanted projects onto the community. And, uh, you know, here even, where uh, I am in Columbus, there's a, a big giant Intel plant. Uh, it was a secret deal. It's, uh, you know, people, they say jobs, 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 but it's gonna use a tremendous amount of water, like 5 million gallons a day, creates a lot of toxic weight. The people were never consulted, uh, no, you know, to, to study how is this gonna affect their lives and do they wanna go there? It was, a you know, the state made a secret deal uh, gave them $2 billion in tax incentives. So this is a common thing there. Uh, yeah, but what you're saying about the community having rights, but then they have to be willing to fight for those rights there and organize. And that's, this film is a classic example of that. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's just uh, so inspiring there. I, I want to, um, oh, somebody asked about now, another thing we, we work toward uh, is rights of nature, that we can protect things that nature is part of us, like you had talked before, and sustains us. And if we don't take care of it, <laughs> we're killing ourselves and all. And so nature should have some rights. And so what we say is it's not exactly personhood, but that nature should have the right to exist, thrive, and flourish, and regenerate there. And by doing that, then we sustain ourselves, Are, and there's uh, movements around the world. Has there been any movement uh, for rights of nature in Mexico that you know of? There, there are, but they are incipient. They are very early in their stages, and it is just beginning to um, gain momentum and further acceptance. Mexico, interestingly enough, has a very complex and very well-developed um, propaganda machine. So they're very, the, the powers to be industry, commerce and politicians, they, they are very effective in countering these uh, concepts, these ideas. So it takes a lot longer for these kinds of ideas and movements to gain critical mass. And uh, interestingly enough, it usually takes certain kind of critical events. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those events are kind of um, uh, destabilizing factors, but those events which can be uh, traumatic and, and uh, it really kind of shakes things, um, those are what generate movements towards uh, enlightening ourselves and developing and, and uh, galvanizing these ideas. I think what, to, to that effect, it's really interesting because community rights and nature rights are going to be part of the overall solution. I think right now, in general, on a world scale, Mankind, um, humans, we have an economic and production model, a, a, a way of life that is not in tune and 
harmonious to the environment. The, the most of our speech and the way we talk, we speak that nature as a third party, as a mm -hmm. distinct entity, as something that is foreign and that we are not a part of. And in fact, we speak of it in terms as commodities, something mm. to be owned, something to be exploited. And it's not that we cannot um, have property and ownership and, and, and use things to produce. We can, but we have to do it in such a way that we're not causing this climate crisis. And I think that community rights and nature rights and these community movements are exactly what's gonna begin to evolve to counter this model that we're in, that's implemented on a world scale that's gonna change the scales to counter the climate crisis. But I just don't know if our destructive path is faster <laughs> and more effective than our community grassroots and evolution. I don't know if we're going to wake up in time before it's too late, but I am convinced that that is the way forward and that that's the path and that that's how we're going to get there. And this is just one small example. And, and I hope that, you know, that's, I hope that everything that happened to us serves as um, a teaching model for other people and that they empower and take on their local and community uh, movements and critical action items to move it forward because that's that's how it's going to happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the local level it you just have to fight the fight that's on mm -hmm. your doorstep because if we all fought the fight that was on our very doorstep we would make a more of a global impact but we have to um yeah fight it at the local level take yeah. you know i hope there's a movement against that factory that bought the farm you know that yeah yeah um you, you you just have to just have to um marshal all the facts mm -hmm. marshal all the laws and mm -hmm. then marshal the community and 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 start growing it little by little by little you know our little whatsapp group 552 people in the first day it's gonna it's gonna keep going mm -hmm. um and and that's what happened with the trey santos thing it started small very small mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah, uh, John, I'd uh, uh, like our viewers to know uh, about the current developments at uh, Toto Santos and some of the things that now you're fighting and working on too, that's uh, involving the sand dunes so that people are uh, uh, know what's going on about that. So uh, one of the most egregious environmental um, violations that uh, Tres Santos did was to basically raise a coastal dune because they wanted to be, you know, they wanted to be up on a perch and out of the floodplain and with a view to the ocean and whatnot, which I can see their point from a developer standpoint, but they totally destroyed uh, an ecosystem. And um, that put a lot of attention on our dune system. And, you know, Todos Santos has been traditionally over the last uh, 100 years has been an uh, agricultural uh, communal land, agricultural based society with ranching, uh, cattle ranching and fishing. So you have these primary production activities. And then all of a sudden from one day to another back in 1994 with the advent of NAFTA, all of a sudden we had constitutional reforms where communal held land can now be private property. And we went from being an agro based community to a tourism based community almost, you know, in the blink of an eye, in less than a generation. Hmm. And so that puts extreme amount of interest on beachfront. And we have this incredible uh, dune system on our coastline and people just want to go and build a condo and a home when it's absolutely a wonderful area. And it's, it's so much more valuable as an environment and as an element of our community than to have a row of homes on there. So mm -hmm. we, out of the Tres Santos uh, work, we found that it was imperative that we protect this environment. So there's been a whole set of initiatives to try to, and there are local regulations that back us up. So that's the only thing that's 
even making it a fight. If there weren't legal protections, there would be nothing we could say about it and we wouldn't be entitled to actually um, begin a defense. So it's taken a while. Uh, I think we've had uh, in general terms, a lot of people that come in with a very pro development because it's economically viable and it's very uh, rentable and it, it makes money. So people are very enticed under those terms. But I can tell you that a lot of the community feels that it's a violation. It's a violation of our local laws. And there is a huge amount of support for the uh, dune system to be preserved and protected. So that's where our efforts have been for the last uh, five years, six years. And we've had um, much, uh, a lot of success, a few setbacks, but we legally we're in a great position. And I think that ultimately we're going to have a lot more success in locking it down and keeping them pristine for our entire community. That's great. Yeah. That, that, that's again as a sort of model for it, I, I think, because John mentions that there were these June scientists at a nearby university. And so we raised some funds and we brought the June scientists. Actually, they were from all over the world, these guys, French, Spanish. Mexican, um, and they mapped, there's 150 miles of dune, and they mapped the dune, and because a lot of people say, oh, I didn't build on the dune, this isn't dune, you know, I built for, so to establish what was a dune, to establish the facts, they came in, we raised the money for them to come in, again, and the community rallied, somebody, somebody paid for their dinner, somebody paid for them to stay mm -hmm. at a hotel, somebody, you know, everybody got together, um, and so now we have this clear report, like, okay, what is the impact? And building on these things is stupid because, you know, they, they protect the whole town. Um, they're also dynamic. So it, actually, if you build a house on it, it is destabilized constantly. Um, we happen to have very bad hurricanes there and they get smashed. So to build one is pretty stupid anyway. Um, but having this report gave us the factual foundation to go out there and as John said the laws so we rallied the laws and we made it all very very clear to the then ultimately I guess the politicians um, that uh, this is not a good idea mm -hmm. um, yeah. so but it was getting all of that information together first that you can marshal all the facts and then start and then what happened the other week when we managed to stop this thing was it was an action was people turning up and turning up with signs and saying no, um, mm -hmm. but it was based on an awful lot of work that was done to establish what the facts were. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that, that's great that you got that and it, it was a good environmental uh, impact statement. Now, sometimes we find that corporations or others and they donate money and, or have a, uh, or even the government agent, uh, you know, have uh, some university or somewhere do a study and sometimes uh, they don't have the results, but that's why we feel that whether or not things are fully understood, because like you said, a lot of nature and its benefits, we don't really fully understand it all. Yeah. And when we're gonna just start to, to erase things, then we don't know what we're doing. So the community knows better, the people who have been indigenous there and live there for a long time. So we feel like they should really decide as, you know, whether the impact statement is, is there or not, but you're right with our legal system, we have to sometimes depend on those things to, to uh, give us some legal backing. But if the people had the right to say, no, we don't want this, then it would be a good thing. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask also about the town. Uh, now the fishermen, the size of the fishermen, they were so prominent, but how was the support in the rest of the town? And, and you mentioned like, there was the, the agricultural uh, uh, people still, I imagine, doing some agricultural aspects. So, so tell us about the rest of the people in the town a little bit, too. It was really quite interesting because originally the fishermen spearheaded the movement because they were the ones who were being directly impacted because the construction was right on their doorstep. But as things uh, evolved and as information started coming out and as people could begin to see that it was impacting them, it wasn't just the fishermen, you know, their, their water is now being diverted over there. Um, mm. In fact, 
the the developer actually illegally uh, obtained a huge water concession from the Ejido. And uh, many of the Ejido members don't even know about that situation. And, uh, but as these other impacts and as the uh, negative uh, and egregious violations started coming out, the popular sentiment and support did become overwhelming. And at, I would say at the height of it, there were only a very select few that were even partially for the developer and mostly because they had some sort of relationship with them through the mm -hmm. university, through employment, um, or they sold land to them or whatever, uh, whatever other kind of uh, participation they had. But um, so the fishermen did a spearhead it but as things evolved, the entire community did rally behind and it became a, a solid community movement. That's great. It, it took a while though. And, it, and in the beginning, it was pretty divisive. You know, it was divisive within the Mexican community, within the fishermen, there are two cooperatives on the beach and the developers had paid classic, as John says in the film, classic divide and conquer, paid mm -hmm. one off and not the other, mm -hmm. which happens all the time in the States too, classic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, divided the Mexican community and the gringo community was divided. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some people whose restaurants were going to really benefit from mm -hmm. having this, you know, mm -hmm. who, and, and it became really sad actually, mm -hmm. because in the beginning, because there were friends that, you know, it was very hard because you dis they, they disagreed, but as John said, it took a while, mm -hmm. but that's why information is, is key. Mm -hmm. and, and, and marshalling all of that information. And, and with the Dunes, we also made a little film, you know, by marshalling things that are visual, mm. um, putting out little, little, you know, getting a drone operator to, to that farm that was sold for the, for the, for the factory then, and, and showing what it means mm. and how it's next to a stream. And in Dune, um, using a drone can be incredibly helpful. Oh, yeah. Because you see things from a different perspective. Because it's and hidden like, behind a wall or something, right? Reach straight into a river, which is right there, or you know. So um, we 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 did a lot of work with a, with a drone on the dunes to show people, um, you know, this is where the arroyo is. This is where the water comes rushing through, and it's going to impact that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some sort of visual. Mm -hmm. um, thing is is very useful i think drones are incredibly useful <laughs> so, yeah to that, to that effect i think that we can see you know a general pattern and it's very important that because i think these are instruments if other people are suffering from these kinds of um, events or acts in their local community information is key so we need to get educate ourselves and get mm. the information we need to um, uh, divulge the information. We need to get the information out there. So networking, social media, we need to have science. You know, we did the studies for the dunes. We did the studies for, the, for all the Tres Santos lawsuits. So science is key. We have to have all of our experts. We have to have geologists, biologists, hydrologists, uh, engineers. And we need to couple this all with our social community efforts our, our, and with our legal efforts. So these components together and also knowing that no matter who it is in the community, they play an important part. If you're an attorney, if you're a, a, a wife and, and a homemaker, if you're a kid and a student, if you're a college student, if you're an intern, everybody plays a part. People should not kid themselves and think that they don't have any power to make a difference. All, every single person played a key role. And it's important that what it, no matter what it is, how insignificant it is individually, when they put that together and we put the science with the legal, with the community, with all, with the information, we can be a force to be reckoned with. And that's what needs to be um, harnessed and mm -hmm. captured and, and used. That, that's where the key is. Yeah. And well, it's not small yeah, and it, it can feel really, you know, lonely. <laughs> it can feel, and, exactly. and, 
And you know, you, you, you're not talking to so-and-so because you have this uh, disagreement over what's right. And, and, it, 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 and it can start very tiny and mm -hmm. feel lonely, but, but it's amazing how if you have, as John says, the science and the law and the everything and the community on your side, how you can build that. It really yeah. is, it's really empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, well, that's, that's the word there. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, I think we're just about uh, out of time and there's so much more we, we could talk about, but this was has been great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just, uh, we we just love the film. We 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 are supportive of uh, you know what you're continuing and 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 inspiring to to do both of you and and uh, this is so so important and we hope other uh, communities also maybe in Mexico are taking some uh, uh, inspiration from what you've done in Todos Santos. I hope too. So any last words before we sign off there? And I'll just tell everyone that uh, if you haven't been able to donate yet and you would like to, then there's a link uh, in the chat and uh, so that we can continue the series going and, and we plan to have uh, some more films, but this has been a great one. Yeah, any last words uh, that you would like to leave with our, our viewers there, uh, John or Sarah? Well, just to say for everybody in the, in the chat, you know, keep going, don't get discouraged, you know, marshal your information marshal your resources. And as John said, you know, it does, it just takes one or two people to, to kick something into happening and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then it grows. So don't, so for everyone in the chat for thank you for taking part and um, don't lose heart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for this space and the opportunity to have this conversation. I, I mean, my, again, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but I can feel you guys out there and I want you guys to know that you're not alone. You've got a brother and a teammate down here in Todos Santos. Whenever you guys come down, stop in and visit. We'll have some mangoes. Keep the <laughs> faith. Stay happy. Keep looking forward. And let's keep on working towards our goal. we got to make it happen. Yeah, and it's up to us, right? Yeah. It is up yeah. to us. Okay, so thank, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, uh, John and Sarah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye, everyone, and thank you for joining us.